So thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Luis Corpus. Uh, I am uh, the chair of the art department over here at South Texas College. Uh, and we have with us today, Tori Thank you for joining Terassi. us today. And he, uh, uh, my name is Luis Corpus. He has some phenomenal works uh, in, in text media form. And uh, we're very fortunate to have him here today with us. So thank you, Tori, for taking the time. Well, uh, thank you, Luis, for inviting me. And um, let me Sure, well, sure well, before here. real quick, before we jump into sure. the presentation, I just I, I did want to make sure we take the time to just quickly acknowledge we um, uh, the fact that we're here, we would typically have Tori in our gallery space and we would typically have his works within our gallery. We have a beautiful building, uh, building B, we have a beautiful gallery out in building B and we would typically invite the artist to come into our gallery and exhibit his work there. But because of the pandemic, we figured that it would be wonderful for us to take the gallery model where we asked the public to come in and with the consideration of safety, turn it upside down and bring the gallery to the public. And you know, the, the format, I think the shift, it's, it's nice because the video will exist within our uh, gallery uh, webpage, within our department webpage for years to come. And so we'll be able to, to experience uh, the body, Tori's body of work and his, his thoughts and his processes for, for years to come. Uh, I did wanna thank a few thank yous um, to, to Freddie, of course, who works tirelessly to help bring these events together. Also to Debbie, uh, Debbie, uh, both of them behind the scenes, we wouldn't be able to do this without them. Uh, our art faculty and our, our students and of course, our admin team, who's very supportive of the visual arts uh, with Dr. Nelson, Dr. Petrosian, Dr. Shirley Reed, who just recently renounced, she's retiring. And I think about the longevity of her career and her impact in the region. Um, thank you for everything you've done uh, over the course of all these years. So uh, also a brief introduction for, uh, for Mr. Terassi. He's originally from the Boston area. Tori Terassi is an intermediate artist and a designer residing in Arlington, Texas, where he is the foundation's coordinator and an associate professor of art and design at the University of Texas at Arlington. After earning his BFA degrees in visual design and English, he received his MFA in visual design from the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth in 2005. The constant interplay between words and images has yielded especially fertile grounds for Tori's research and serves as a common thread connecting all creative activity. His ambitions as a communicator are to reconsider the conventions through which we experience text and images by way of exploring the simultaneously independent and interdependent nature of their relationship. So once again, Mr. Tori, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you for having me. Um, let's, let me switch over here. Okay. Higher up presentation. Okay, well, um, let's see if I can move this out of the way. Okay, that's good enough. <laughs> well, uh, again, thank you for inviting me. Um, actually, there's several people at at um, at South Texas that I that I would like to just give some quick thanks to uh, Phyllis Leverich, uh, who kind of started this whole conversation about me possibly uh, ex exhibiting down there. Um, Richard Smith and, and Freddie, who originally reached out to me, um, and, and yourself, Louise. So I, I really appreciate uh, the work of, of all of you. And, and as you mentioned, um, I'm sure there's countless other people that I have not met that are, have also gone into putting this together. So um, thank you all. Um, so my, uh, my, my name is Tori Tarasi. I am you know, from, from the Boston area, and um, my, my artworks primarily are rooted in um, the relationship between text and images. Sometimes they exist exclusively as text and sometimes they exist exclusively as images um, and sometimes they're both. Um, and so that's why I've, I've chosen to call this visual language um, as the, the title of, of my, um, my exhibition. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so, um, so if you are, 20 years old, you probably don't know what you're looking at right now. Um, if you're my age or close to it or older, you know exactly what this is. 
Um, I almost feel like this should be cash prizes if you're 25 and under and you know what this is. Um, this is a strip of microfilm. And what microfilm was, it's not around anymore. Um, it was a photographic way of archiving old magazines and newspapers, periodicals, journals, and even books so that they could fit in, um, in a library archive and not take up a bunch of space. So if you have the New York Times and it's, you know, it's this thick and it's, you know, this, this wide, this tall, you know, week after week that adds up. But if you can take a year's worth of the New York Times and scrunch it down onto a roll of film about the size of your fist, that saves a lot of space. Um, as universities and libraries started to become uh, more digitally oriented, they started to throw away this stuff. And I came across several libraries that were get, getting rid of it. And I asked if I could have it because um, I thought it was just interesting to work with. So uh, years went by and uh, I didn't do anything with this stuff. And finally, my wife insisted either bake something with that microfilm or throw it out. So um, I started to play and and kind of just see what I could do with this stuff. These are these are long, long, long strips of film. Um, and so I started to weave them. And so this is a close up of, um, of one of the pieces, but you can, you can actually see the, the page layouts um, sort of within the, the microfilm. So it's too small to read, but if, if you, once you put it in a special machine, it will magnify that image for you and you can, you can read the, the media and the material. Um, I always found the, um, this material interesting because it kind of embodies what I'm interested in, right? Like working with text and language and literature, design, layout, grids, but also, um, you know, photography, uh, which is a you know, form of art. So uh, there are some themes at play here, obviously grids, um, organizational systems and structures is something that, that we'll, we'll revisit throughout my presentation. Um, this notion of archive, course language and text. And there's a Latin word, because uh, I was the cool kid in high school who took Latin, I wasn't able to take French. Uh, so I took uh, Latin and um, the word texere, which serves as the root word for our current day words of text and texture. Um, it also serves as the root word for weaving. And so I thought, oh, that was kind of interesting because that's exactly what I was doing with it. and. Um, so I started to create these woven microfiche, uh, microfilm uh, pieces. These are 36 inches by 36 inches. And um, I think, you know, one of the things that sort of draws me to these, these structures is um, sort of the connotations that the images carry, right? So not only is there all the, that language and, and media present, but there's also these beautiful squares and grids and forms that are present. Um, and it, it kind of makes allusions to um, agriculture, to architecture, to um, it looks like an aerial view of a city. So like urban planning. Um, and then of course, all the ties that it has with, with design. Um, it also kind of looks like a QR code or a microchip. Um, and, it, and it's sort of reminiscent of like, you know, Pete Mondrian's work. So, um, I think all of these things are kind of coming together with, with this uh, series. Um, I, I began to experiment a little bit more with the pieces. Um, as you can see on the, on the right hand side, I, I tried to paint on it. It's just a quick self portrait. Um, surprisingly enough, it, it actually does take paint pretty well. Um, on the right hand side was my attempt at making a gradient. So I took some dark microfilms and wove them in the upper left corner and then the lighter ones, the lower right corner, and then in the middle where it was sort of the, the grayer values. Um, so, you know, I was working with a lot of restrictions, right? I mean, I can't like, I can't manipulate this material easily. Um, so I just have to kind of come up with clever ways of sort of weaving it in and out. Um, so to take it yet another step further, I wanted to have more control over the compositions and uh, recognizing that the material that I was working with was inherently transparent. Um, and, and this notion of transparency, you're gonna see throughout 
my presentation. I, I work with transparency a lot in my work. Um, so I, I actually bleached a lot of microfilm to create a, uh, a skeletal, naked, empty um, grid. And then within that grid, I, I rewove um, unbleached microfilm and it allowed me to compose these spaces. Um, and these are just, um, uh, the series is entitled Grid Studies. And it, this is really just, I'm just studying the grid. I'm just studying form. There's, there's no concept behind it other than the shapes and the lines in the positive and negative space. Um, and so I made a, you know, a handful of these and, and I moved on. Um, as I was collecting all of this microfilm, let me just keep a close eye on the time here. Um, as I was um, collecting the microfilm, the librarians or the universities or whoever it was that was giving it to me would say, you know, we also have a bunch of microfiche, which is a slightly different version of microfilm, right? So instead of coming out in rolls of film, uh, they're, they're given to you in, in sheets that are, you know, more like this size, um, and you put them in a machine. They, they're essentially the same thing. Um, and so I, I said, sure, sure, I'll take those two. And uh, with those, I allowed myself um, more freedoms, more creative freedoms in terms of um, cutting the material and, and kind of finding the bits and pieces that I wanted uh, with, the, with the larger uh, grids that you just saw, um, the, the images would just sort of be what they were, right? I would weave them and then whatever patterns emerged, that's what I got. But with these, um, I was more conscientious in the design. And so I made about 30 of these, these measure 10 inches by 10 inches. And um, for each one, I, I would let my mind wander, but there was also like an inspirational goal. So like in the lower right-hand corner, um, I went into that composition thinking, all right, I want to create a square or I want to imply a square with the negative space. And so I, that was really my only objective with that particular composition. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, um, as I was cutting the microfilm, I noticed there was all these beautiful little dots um, just inherent in the, in the film. And as I started to line up the dots, it created all of this... Um, all of the material that was attached to the dots created like these wings. And I go, oh, that kind of looks like a dragonfly. And then I just went with it. And then I just sort of had played these little games for each one. But I have a series of these and there's about 30 of them. Um, so I thought that that material was interesting. And um, with, with all of my works, let me click on this, I also try to create kinetic work or animated work. So my, my training, my background is in animation and design. Um, of course, what you just saw is very not <laughs> design or, or, or animated. Um, and so I wanted to see, can I animate one of these grids? And um, what you're seeing here is a very, very compressed version of one of these animated grids. But um, I just think it's beautiful and, and meditative um, in a lot of ways. Uh, and just kind of get out of it what you want. This is a moving grid. Um, I, I think this notion of, of meditative, contemplative work is another um, sort of overarching theme throughout, throughout all that I do. Um, so this goes on for a few minutes, but I, I think you know, we've seen enough of it. You, you, you can always go to my website to, uh, to see more of it if, if, you, if you'd like. Um, Go to the next one. So this leads me to my next uh, body of work. I'm going to show approximately four bodies of work, but they, they all kind of interconnect. That's why I'm, I'm showing them in this order. Um, these are called timescapes. And, and um, again, with this upcoming series, I'm, I was very sort of um, you know cognizant of grids, grid systems, grid structures, um, and also time or, or the idea of, of temporal qualities. Um, and then now culture is also starting to, to come into this work. So, um, so I guess I'll explain technically what these are first and then get into some of the other things. So when I first got my, um, my first smartphone, um, 
it had the, the panoramic feature, right? So I'm sure we've all done this, right? You, you, you click that button and then you move the camera across and you get a, a, a long panoramic image. And uh, I sort of immediately recognized, oh, there's some potential here with this technology, uh, as simple as it is. And, um, you know, I started to, to notice that a lot of artists were creating these landscapes, which was fine, but I also thought completely unoriginal. Um, and so um, I started to play with how I could work with that technology and, and um, come up with some new kinds of imagery. So anyway, uh, long story short, I, I recognized that um, if, I, if I was moving, rather than if my hand was moving, but if my body was moving, I could get some unique images. So um, in my travels, I, I went to Seoul, South Korea, and they have a very advanced subway system. And I started to go on the trains and I started to shoot images while moving on these trains. And so, um, like in this particular shot, I think I, well, really the whole series kind of looks like this, where it's like this deep black environment. And then when you enter a station or when a train passes you, the artificial lights really light up the camera and the, the, the machine starts taking pictures and stitching them together. And I just loved this composition, how like these, there's these splashes of color in this otherwise grayscale environment, like this red jacket or this neon green venting machine. Um, and so these, these colors kind of splash out at you. Um, sometimes I, I, I capture an image like this, um, which is, is just as much luck as it is skill. Um, in, in this particular station, um, there was multiple tracks. So instead of just two tracks, like one running north, one running south, there was like, like six tracks, right? All, they're all going in different directions. Um, and so when I first enter the station, I'm seeing a train a couple tracks away and then midway into the station, another train from the opposite direction cuts right in front of me. And so this, this girl that you're looking at here, she was, she was in another train, obviously, but she was like, you know, like this close to my face, like my face is here, her face is here and I'm holding the phone like right in her face and she didn't know what to do. <laughs> and she's just kind of like, kind of looks to the side and then her train starts pulling away, my train starts pulling away, and then the camera starts to continue taking that photograph. Um, and then at the very end, you see a little bit of the station on the right-hand side. Um, and it just, I just knew right away, I'm like, oh, that's gonna be a really nice image. <laughs> um, you know, I, I continue to experiment with this. So um, I start moving the camera as I'm taking a shot. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of liked how this, the subway, this train looked like a mechanical worm. It's like this monster that lives underground. Um, and then you have the people here on the left-hand side that they're just so calm and they're just waiting to, to go inside the belly of this beast. And, you know, this, it started to get me thinking about like our relationship with, with not only technology, but like our, our systems, right? So like grids, you know, you have, you have, the systems of the streets above you, you have systems of the train system below you. Everything is based off of these grids and how we organize our culture and how we organize our thoughts as, as people. Um, and I just thought you know, some of the aesthetics were really playful. Um, so now, now, now I, I realized, so this was after several years, um, I made the, the microfiche pieces, microfilm pieces, and I made the, the photographs. And then it occurred to me, I'm like, oh my God, they're aesthetically, they're the same exact thing, right? They're exactly the same thing. They're these, they're these long strips that are rooted in, in a grid structure. And the grid, by coincidence, has the same rhythm, right? It's like positive space, negative space, positive space, negative space, positive space, negative space, with the occasional interruptions in between. And so I made a mashup series and um, there's really no, as, as with the, uh, the, the photographs that you just saw, there's no digital manipulation. That's what the camera saw. Like that's when I opened up my photos, that's what I got. I didn't like create these things in Photoshop. I created them in the, in the act of taking the picture. Um, 
And so here, yes, there, there is some Photoshop, but I'm just using Photoshop to merely take the microfilm and the photograph and put them together. Um, but you can see the, the rhythm. You can see the same structures are at play. Um, go to the next one. Um, I was mindful as to which strip of microfilm would be combined with which photograph. Um, now, of course, the, the primary goal of the series was an aesthetic one, but um, like in this particular one, I was mindful that, you know, if I took a, a strip of microfilm from a magazine called Ebony, which is about African-American culture exclusively, and I merge it with a, um, a photograph uh, from South Korea, which is a very homogenous culture, right? There's, I mean, 99.9 .9 of the people that you see in South Korea and are South Korea are Korean, right? Very unlike the United States where you've got this, this melting pot of people. And I thought, well, wouldn't that be kind of interesting if I just sort of play one culture against the other visually? Um, and so I, I start playing these games, both conceptual and aesthetic. Um, and so in this particular mashup, um, you know, if, uh, the next slide is a, is a zoomed in version of this image. So I'm going to jump to that. Um, so you can see here that um, I was very careful about which strips of microfilm would line up with certain parts of the image. So the photograph is not manipulated. That's really what this, that station looked like. And so I said, okay, well, if I find these black tiled um, microfilms and I line up with the black tiled ceilings, I'll have something there. Um, if I take these sort of light pages on a, on a, with black text and I line it up with the, the doors that open and close to let you into the train, those share a lot of aesthetic values. Um, and so I, I would start to put these things together um, and, and create, create the series. And there's about 15 of these, 15 or 16 uh, of these images um, that, I, that I put together. I really love this one because it's a, kind of one of the rare microfilms that had, that's like white text with a black page um, with white negative space. And it just so happened that this particular station was had like white walls with black doors and they just merged. So it looks like that piece of, sh of sh uh, film is just running right through the environment, but it's not. Um, those are two completely different things. Um, and again, just the aesthetic playfulness of, of what's happening here with the series. Uh, and these are um, size wise, I'm trying to think of the exact dimensions, but they're large ish. I want to say they're like maybe 28 inches or so long by maybe like 12 or 14 inches tall. So they're, they're long and, um, and wide, but they're not, they're not super tiny. Um, and, you know, some don't have any people or any, anything. They were just sort of abstracted images that I happened to catch in a particular moment. And I thought, well, you know, it's different than the other images, but it's beautiful. Uh, and I, then I just had to find an appropriate piece of material that went with it. Um, so this abstracted uh, part of the microfilm. Um, one thing that you probably can't see in the presentation, just because we're not looking at this like in our actual space, is on the far left-hand side in the, in the black box uh, of the microfilm, it says the end. And anytime you came to the end of the film, there was usually some sort of designation put on by the University of Michigan who made like 90% of the world's microfilm. Um, it always said the end. And I, I, in some of my compositions, I would play with that idea of like the end <laughs> and then like think about how that would, would match up aesthetically. You can see just some, some more playing here. Um, And so, you know, yes, I am digitally manipulating um, the, the microfilm. I, I'm like digitally slicing it up and then recomposing it. Um, but that's, that's really all I'm doing. Uh, so this will kind of uh, bring me to the next half of the presentation, um, my work with design and typography and animation. Um, so some of the themes that are at play here um, are reading experiences, and, and I really take to heart that term experience, right? Like, of course, anytime we read, it's an experience, but how, as an artist or as a designer, how can you really play 
with that idea of, of experience um, or user experience. Um, of course, time or the temporal or ephemeral is also very present um, in my, my work with, with design and type, a kinetic experimentation, and this balance between legible and illegible, readable and not readable, um, and text and image. So let's take a look at some of, some of these works. Um, so th these are these are posters, uh, obviously, um, and they they've sort of exhibited and been in poster competitions. Um, maybe you've come across them, um, but neither of these fonts or typefaces were developed for print. Um, actually, both of these typefaces were developed for um, animation, and it wasn't until after I made the animation that I decided to try to retrofit it for print. Um, and so you'll see the animation for, for one of these, but with the image on the, on the left, uh, the, the gray image says, um, I am sorry, but I do not understand. What are you saying? I am confused. We must overcome our differences. Um, and on the right hand side, it says we are all connected, but it can unravel so easily. Both of these posters were made very, 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 very shortly after the election of Donald Trump in 2016. Um, I, along with half of the country, immediately recognized what was happening for the worse, since I'm not <laughs> directly tied to uh, uh, South Texas College. I can, I can say that without fear of getting in trouble. So I, I will say it on behalf of what probably everyone is thinking, he's a horrible person, he's a horrible president. Uh, and he needs to, we need to get rid of him as soon as we possibly can. Um, so there, <laughs> come get me, South Texas. I know you, you can't get me. Um, but, but these pieces are in a, in a direct, not, not really a reaction to him, but, but more of a response to the environment that was created and that still exists that was able to allow him to rise to power. And it's this idea of, us versus them. Or it's this idea of, well, I have mine and you have yours and nowhere in between shall we mix. And that's just not the reality of it. Um, that's not the reality of it economically. That's not the reality of it environmentally. That's not the uh, reality of it socially, culturally. From any perspective you wanna, you wanna approach it from, we are connected to everyone else, not only in this country, but across the world, right? A virus breaks out in China, it affects us, right? We are all connected. One economy tanks, the whole world gets affected. Um, so whether you believe that or not, I'm telling you, <laughs> you, you need to, right? Um, and so these pieces are, are a reminder, like, hey, folks, like not only should we recognize some of these, these, uh, these philosophies, but um you know we need to kind of take action on it right and so like you know we need to understand our differences we have to overcome our, our differences so um i'll kind of revisit some of those themes when we get to the animations um but again from a from a typographic standpoint from a design standpoint um i'm always interested in experimenting with letter forms and and walking that balance between legibility and illegibility and seeing how far i can take it um, so years ago, I was, I was all set to go to graduate school um, at Arizona State. And for one reason or another, it just, it just didn't work out. So I moved back to Massachusetts. And um, while I was waiting for my bank to open, to set up a, a new bank account, um, in about 10 minutes, I put together this typeface. And I, because I'd always wanted to make a, a font that used exclusively circles. I thought, all right, well, I've got some time now. Let's sketch it out. Let's just see if I can do it. Um, and then, so, I, and I did it. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, I refined it a little bit. And then um, this is, this has been one of my more famous pieces. Um, it's exhibited in, in several design books and it's been in competitions and stuff. Uh, and just for those of you that can't see it, it just starting from the top left, it just goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, all the way to Z. So you're just seeing A to Z. Um, 
And uh, I, I think it just goes to speak to sometimes your best work just comes from a sheer desire to play and a sheer willingness to experiment. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to take a long time to do it. It just, just do it. And then, you know, you'll produce a lot of junk, but then you'll produce some stuff that's really good too. Um, early on in my musings with um, design and, and type and language and all of that, um, I was, I had come out of a, you know, my undergrad and in a, in a short career in industry in which my eyes were glued to a computer monitor all the time. And I had told myself, all right, I'm going to take three months and I'm not going to use the computer creatively at all. And I want to see what I could do. So with this piece, this is an artist book, um, which, which actually uh, is now in the, the um, permanent collection uh, at Baylor University in Waco. Um, I wanted to see if I could create uh, an interactive work, uh, like an interactive narrative, like kind of the way a website works, and uh, an animated kinetic reading experience, the way an animation works. But I didn't want to use the computer at all, uh, other than to just print out the letters. And so um, I, I figured out, okay, I've got these bottles, I'll fill them with water and I'll work with transparent um, sheets of transparent film and print on them. Again, that notion of transparency coming up again. And so what happens is the user will pick up the bottle, they spin the bottle around and then these messages will appear. So each bottle has maybe three or four phrases that are read in a non-linear fashion as you rotate the, the bottle around. And then depending on which bottle you pick up, because there's no, there's no predetermined order, you're also getting a non-linear narrative that way. So it, so it really is like the way a website works or with hyperlinks. It's, a, it's interactive, it's, um, it's non-linear, but in the end, you do get a sense of what the piece is about or what the story uh, was trying to tell you. Um, and so I thought, okay, there's, there's something there. There's something with this idea of working with my hands and, and working with new techniques, forcing myself to work with new techniques. Um, so let me play this video. Um, and so I took a lot of the sensibilities that I had discovered with that and I, and I kept working in that manner. So this was another piece that I came up with in that three month window. Um, a lot of, you know, technically it's very similar to the, the, the book that you just saw, uh, but this is an installation piece, large scale projection. Um, the bigger the wall, the better. Um, and uh, you can see here in the lower right hand corner, right, there's somebody standing in front of this and it's, the letters are like crawling all over her. Um, you can see the setup in the upper right hand corner. This is a low tech form of animation, essentially. Um, but when you watch the video, it, it actually has a really nice quality. And um, again, these ideas of, of meditative spaces um, and this idea of playing with language, playing with poetry. So this piece is entitled Poem Number Blank because it, I think it's a poem, but there's no direct or obvious meaning behind it. It's more of like a visual poem, but it implies words. And I've had a lot of people come up to me and, and tell me that they've seen specific words and messages in there. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's not that that, that you you made that. That wasn't me. Like you you saw that. Um, so anyway, this was another uh, another example of just play and experimentation um, yielding something that was really really powerful. Um, and again, I, I this was in graduate school. And when I presented this uh, at the end of the semester, you know, this was a big gallery space with 40 faculty members and they just sat there in silence for like 10 minutes. They didn't say anything. And you're just gonna have to take my word to get, to get 40 professors to, to say nothing for any duration of time is like monumental. I can see Luis is smiling because he knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and they were just sort of struck by, by the simplicity of it, but also I think by the, by kind of the beauty and the meditative quality of it. 
And so again, I, I, I had recognized, okay, I've got something here. Where can I go with it forward? And so after I, I spent that three month hiatus away from the machine, I went back to the computer, but I went back to the computer with a new sense of sensibilities and um, a new sense of bravery. I'm like, okay, now I can really be playful and wacky and experimental and merge it with software and I'll see what I can do. And so then this piece was yielded. Um, and I think you can, you can kind of clearly see how my playing with uh, off screen and merging it with on screen skills gave me what you're seeing here. And so this piece is entitled memory. Now conceptually, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to bring the visual word a step closer to the spoken word. So when, when we speak, that's a, that's a, a short term text, right? And when, when we stop speaking, the, the story only exists in the memories of those that hear it. Uh, and that's very similar to time-based media, right? You experience it, you move on from it, and then what you just experience is gone, never to be seen again. Um, this is very different from the way the printed page works. Whereas if you want to go back to page 12, you can just flip the book back and reread it. You can't as easily do that with an animation um, or with time-based media. Um, and since I'm in control of the mouse, if you wanted to go back and see an earlier point of the animation, you can't, right? So um, I, I kind of like that idea of trying to make text behave more like speech, trying to have um, trying to have design behave more like art, right? I'm just kind of always playing these ideas off each other. Um, you can see this on my website. I'm going to skip ahead to the next the next piece. So. Um, so I'm, I'm always asked, sometimes even in interviews, um, but I'm also always asking myself, are you an artist or are you a designer? You know, which one are you? Because you can't be both. There's like some unwritten rule, like you can't, you can't do both. Um, and I've just refused to firmly say that I'm one or the other. Um, and I think that's partly why I, I ended up in foundations because foundations is at the root of both of those disciplines. Um, prior to me taking the position as foundations coordinator, I was a professor of design at a different school. Um, and actually starting next year, I'm gonna be teaching more design courses ironically, but uh, so I created this piece and it's asking these questions like, well, you know, it's sort of this cheesy existential poem, you know, who, who am I, what, what am I? But it does beg the question, like the type in the front is very designerly, the animation and the technical skills are very designerly, but the self-portrait in the back that's fading in and out of existence is very artistic. And so it's this, this balance between art and design. And it's really just, this piece was really created more for me than it is was for anyone else, but it was just sort of my expression of like, well, these are some of the issues that I'm dealing with all the time in my creative work and in my career, and maybe Maybe you're having similar experiences. Um, okay, this piece has audio. Um, the audio is obnoxious. Um, but before I, I press play, uh, there's two things I want to note. Um, the animation that you're seeing here is what inspired the print pieces that you saw a few slides back. I told you that they were originally designed for animation. So this is one of those fonts. Um, and then the second thing is, the manipulation of the letter forms were manipulated by sound. So I actually used sound waves. I hooked up a, I, I, over here, you can't see it, but over here, I've got like these big bass amplifiers. You can see I have instruments in the back. So I've got these big amplifiers and I actually rigged up the system to agitate a material that would disrupt the physical qualities of type that I, that I put on the, on a tray. And then the sound waves would, agitate or or disrupt the letter forms so that's what you're seeing here uh, and i'll play it but you're gonna have to hear it as well
So for the purposes of the presentation, that was just a, a shorter clip from the larger animation. Um, but as you noticed in the poster that you saw just a few slides ago, um, it's this conversation that's happening between people. You know, like, what are you saying? I don't understand. You know, we have to figure out how we're going to speak to each other, how we're going to communicate, how we're going to exist, coexist. Um, and so that's what that, that piece was about. And so the, the sounds were just sort of abstractions of just two different tribes, right? Just two different people um, trying to communicate with each other. And, and, and not only trying to communicate with each other, but recognizing the need to communicate with each other, right? They're, they're re they recognize they need to understand each other, even though they don't know how. I feel like that's kind of where we are, uh, not only globally, but nationally as well. Okay. Um, so the last uh, sort of last few slides here. Um, so as most of us watching this presentation, we've always sort of maybe doodled in our notebooks. And, and I very distinctly remember in the second grade, when I finished my work early, I would always create these, uh, these line drawings. Um, and I was never, uh, I was never a skilled artist. Um, I, I can't draw from life. I can't draw from memory. I can't draw representational images very good. Um, but I do abstractions okay. So um, I would always draw these lines and these lines had a rule. The rule was the line couldn't touch itself. Um, and I would try to create these, um, I would try to work myself into like problems or corners and then I'd have to work myself back out of them again. Um, and that idea just always resonated with me and it always stuck with me through all these years, since I was eight years old till, till now. And it wasn't until recently that I kind of recognized, I'm like, no, there's something there. There's, I can do something with this artistically, professionally. So I created an, first an alphabet, A to Z. Um, it took me to, took me maybe six hours to create each letter. So two hours by pencil, two hours by pen, and then two hours in Illustrator to retrace it. So that was my process. Um, and then you can see, and you can also see here with this large A, um, you know, on to the left of the A, there's this little line and to the right of the A is another little line. And that's, if you were to follow those lines, you would come out the other side. So it's this, this labyrinth, this, this um, again, it's almost like this Buddhist meditative path, this journey. Um, but I thought oh, that's kind of fun because if you if you had all, all the whole alphabet, you could set like the complete works of Shakespeare using one single line. Or if you had all the languages of the world, provided that they use Roman characters, you could they all connect, right? They're all they're all interconnected with just one single stroke. Um, and so you know, I, I, then I then I found this this quote by Paul Clay: "A line is a dot that went for a walk," and I fell in love with that. And um, it's a pretty famous quote. And I thought that's perfect for this. Um, and so I made some experimental, you know, designs. Um, and, but I also made artwork with it. So um, again, themes for these lines, patience, discipline, reflection, specifically self-reflection, um, journey path, meander, labyrinth. And by labyrinth, I don't mean a maze with which you get stuck in. I just mean more of like a, um, uh, it's, it's almost like a maze that you don't get stuck in. It's more like a path, a meandered path um, and meditative. It was very, it's very meditative making these pieces because you're just so into, um, you're just so into the line that you just, it, 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 you, you have to focus because if you don't focus on that line, you're going to make a mistake. You're going to, you know, the line will cross over or you'll smudge it or something. Um, so it does help focus you. Uh, and so I, I started to, um, I used a laser cutter on these and I laser cut these on wood. These are, uh, the laser cutter was 18 by 24. So these are up, up just about the full bed of the laser cutter. So they're about 18 by 24. They might be like 16 by 22, but they're in that range. Um, and they're just abstractions. And I actually did a, a whole series of these. Um, I, I had one of my printmaking friends, we, we made some screen prints. 
Um, I did these on acrylic glass. So again, transparent material. Um, and so when the light shines on them, you can see like the, the, the depth of these, this, this line kind of going back in space. Um, these are some of the, the lasers. Um, and then the, my, my most recent work is this, uh, it's a scroll. And it's, it's all done by hand, as you can see. Um, I started this like almost two years ago. Now, since March came, since the pandemic really broke out, I, I have not worked on this um, because I had to roll it up and put it high because I, my studio needed to convert into a, a school for my kids and I did not want this piece being destroyed. So I just rolled it up and put it out of their reach. Um, so I haven't really worked on it since then, but prior to that, I was working on it at least five times a week for at least 30 minutes, sometimes for an hour, sometimes 45 minutes. And each time I'd work on it, I would make a little archive. So the image on the right, you can barely, barely see it, but to the, to the left of the, of the scroll, there's, a, there's pinned, there's the, a handwritten journal of, of every time I did this. So it would be like, you know, November 12th, 30 minutes, November 14th one hour, 15 minutes. Um, and I, and that, so there's an archive of how long it took me to do this. Um, since the time that this photograph was taken, it's, it's grown an extra, another probably six to eight feet. Um, so it's, it's pretty long and it's about eight feet tall on the wall and about probably another eight or 10 feet out on the floor. And then, like I said, I have since then made another six to eight feet. So it's, I mean, it's, it's a pretty long thing. Um, and I just couldn't help but think, and actually I have a video, so I'll play a little bit of this. And you can see how fast or not fast I make this. Um, and there is some audio, but it's just ambient background audio. So I'll talk over it. Um, so you can see how excruciatingly slow it, 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 it builds and how tight those lines are. Those lines are maybe an eighth of an inch. I mean, they're, they're really, really tight. Um, they're about the same distance as like when you write your name on a piece of paper, right? Like the distance between an A and a B, it's like that much space. Um, and of course, I, I mean, I'm sort of alluding to just I was just very meditative. I, I understand that there's like, because it's in a scroll form and it, there's a lot of this sort of almost philosophical thought, it, it does imply very religious things, but none of those are actually actively there. Um, what, one thing that, that did sort of inspire me was um, when, the, when the Buddhist monks create these sand mandalas and they spend weeks, I mean, I'm talking like 10 hour days for weeks making these intricate sand mandalas only to just <laughs> sweep them away. Um, they, they look at it and they go, oh, that's nice. And then they just destroy it instantly. So someday my, my plan is to make this as long as I can make it, have a, you know, if I'm lucky enough to have like a semi-major exhibition in a, in a museum and then burn it. On the last day of the exhibition, just burn this thing from, from the end to end and just let it just let it disintegrate. Uh, I think that would be just awesome. Um, but I don't have the guts to burn it now. It's <laughs> all the time and effort I've put into it. Um, and I, I also, I work in pen. Um, and I think there's, by working in pen, there's an intensity. It's like, if I mess up, the whole thing is messed up. So I think there's, it adds to the quality of the work when people recognize, oh crap, he's doing this in pen. Like, don't mess up. And, and I think that that adds value to this. Um, but I think there's also something to be said about just, just getting to work, right? You don't need a grand idea. I don't have a grand idea. It's just, I'm making a line, I'm making a pattern with the line and I'm gonna go as long as I can go. That's the idea. Um, it's really about labor and, and work and just, doing it um so you know sometimes inspiration hits you and you do something really clever and creative and the rest of the time i, I think there's value of just saying well the creativity is not flowing so at least the labor can and maybe something yields from that uh so that really brings me to the end of of my talk um i'd like to thank you all again um i have these four images up and i can leave them up just as a 
as a reminder of what I showed. And if you have questions, then uh, I guess now would be a good time to ask them. Thank you, Cody. You, you know, you said something that that stuck out for me, and I think it's very relevant to to a lot of a lot of our students, so a lot of people in general, like a, lot, a lot of creative individuals. And what you said is, as as you were growing up, one of the things that you felt was, "I was never a skilled artist." And I think it touches on the idea that what a lot of people feel that in order to be considered one of the good artists, you have to be naturally gifted at drawing. Mm -hmm. You also talked about um, the question uh, that, that is posed to you, are you a designer or are you an, an artist? I don't really feel that you have to be anything for anybody other than you know, true to yourself and what you're doing right now in building these meditative, contemplative spaces. I see a lot of playing with the idea of time, like temporal, but then moving against the, the, the stillness of these images. I think what you're doing is phenomenal. Uh, it's beautiful work. Well, well, thank you. Um, yeah, and if I could just maybe respond to, to, to that. Um, so yeah, I, I was not like the artsy kid. Um, I was, I was the athletic kid, right? I mean, you can see I'm wearing a hockey jersey, right? I mean, like that was my thing, right? Um, I didn't, and, I, and I, I liked art, you know, growing up, but I wasn't an artist. And it wasn't until my junior year of college, so not high school, but college, that I woke up one day and I decided I want to be an artist. I, I saw what was going on in the art department. I go, A, they look like they're having a lot of fun. B, they're creative and I felt like I was creative. Um, I was a business major for, for a semester and I'm like, no, that's not, I'm like, this is not for me. Um, then I was an English major and that actually worked out pretty well. Um, and I, I actually did get dual degrees with English and art, but I, I wanted more, I wanted more creativity. And I just, I just made the plunge. And so one of the things that I, I kind of pride myself on is because I always have felt like I've, I've lacked the inherent skill that some artists have like to sculpt or paint i can't do any of that is i had to i had to think even more creatively i had to i had to be more experimental i had to push the boundaries more to get noticed because if i didn't i always felt like my skill was just never good enough so i had i had to do other things to to get attention or, or to get um credibility um and so yeah i think i think you know and when you talk to a lot of artists, you realize that they all have similar stories. They're like, oh yeah, I was a, I was, you know, studying nursing for three years or yeah, I was doing engineering and I did that for five years out for this industry. And then I came back and, you know, artists are almost never artists. They're always something else first. And then they, they kind of come to, to be artists at some point. So um, yeah, just go for it. Bio major. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So we have a uh, we uh, we have some some questions from from a few students. I'm just gonna you know, ask you okay. some of the questions that came in during your talk. Uh, first one is from uh, Liana Olvera. Um, what inspired you to do all of this? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, but it's, it's of course very open ended and very difficult to answer. Um, I think at the, at the, the very core, I think, why do we do anything? Right. And, and I've thought about this question a lot and I've asked this question of not only other artists, but people from other disciplines. Um, I, I met a, a brain surgeon and, um, and I asked him, why, why did you, how did you get into that? Like, wh why did you get into that? And um, when he gave his answer, I was almost floored because it was exactly the same answer that I give for why I do what I do. And it's because it's just how I come to understand the world I live in. Um, musicians create music because it helps them, it helps them just take in what they're experiencing in their, in their lives, in their world, and then express themselves. And that's kind of what I do. 
um, you know, my work is not necessarily passionate. It's not overly personal, but these are my ideas. I'm, I'm very interested in I said systems and structure and language and these, these little nuances of our cultures. Um, and that's what interests me. So I create work that kind of explores those fringes. Uh, so that's, that's really, that's my answer. It's just, it's how I understand things. And, it, and not only is it how I understand things, but I think more importantly, it's how I have the ability to understand things. If I don't understand something, I try to create a, a piece about this thing I don't understand and it helps me to understand whatever that is, whether it's loss or whether it's triumph or whether it's uh, economics or whatever it is, it helps me to learn. Wonderfully stated. Um, the, the next question is from Ashley Gonzalez. And she asked, are you planning on making more of those types of models? And I think she was referring to, it's an earlier question. So I think she was refer, referring to your, your grid using the, the microfilm. Um, yeah, kind of. So I think with, with everything that I create, once I start creating it, I, I always keep it in the back of my mind. And I think well, maybe I'll revisit it, right? So with the, with the microfilm, so the, well, let me start maybe more chronologically. With my type and my design and my animation, that's something I've been doing for, you know, 15 to 20 years. And I'm gonna to continue to do that. So every, every so often, if I get an idea, I will build on that body of work. Um, with the grids, you know, I've, I've tried them small, I've tried them large, I've tried them animated, um, you know, I've, I've tried different things. I've always wanted to make a huge one, like, like, as big as, like, you know, 60 feet by 60 feet, like a giant one. So if I were to do one, it would be something like that, you know, maybe install it, like, in a library or something and just donate it. Um, as far as, as far as some of the other ones, like, the subways. I, I don't think I'm going to make anything more with that. I might try to animate one, um, an animated kinetic subway image, but, uh, and then the line is also sort of an ongoing thing. Um, I don't know if I'll make more compositions, but the scroll is something I'll probably continue to work on. I would also like to make that large scale, like, you know, like, like inside a whole interior wall at the DMA or something like it's just a massive, massive piece that would take me years to do. Um, so that's kind of where I stand on, on that stuff. And then the, the, uh, having to find all that microfilm also, I think that would be, <laughs> well, I still get a bunch of it. So <laughs> yeah, f finding the material, you can't get it anymore because we're at the point where all of the libraries and universities have already gotten rid of it. So, mm -hmm. I have some in my closet and I have to just make it work with that because you can't get it anymore. Here's from uh, Sabrina Resendez. How, how would you say that your technique style has changed over time? Uh, yeah, that's a good, another good question. Um, well, so I think when I first started, you know, because I wasn't, or at least I never felt like I was skilled, I kind of felt like, okay, my, my technique has to be, has to be computer, has to be digital. I have to be really good at that. Um, and then I, I kind of discovered that I can do more by getting off of that tool sometimes. So if you're a painter, by all means, paint, but, you know, try your hand at clay, you know, and then maybe you can merge that or try your hand at printmaking and see what happens um, or literature or film, right? Like, you know, you should be good at your discipline, but you should also be open-minded to like try different things. And I think once I... Um, unplugged for that three month period, it, it really made me realize, oh, wait a minute, there's more than just being good at like After Effects or Flash or Photoshop. Um, Flash doesn't even exist anymore, it's, it's animate now. Um, but instead of just being good at that, like take those skills, but combine them with other things that you're good at. So if you're good at riding your bike or rollerblading, see if you can somehow incorporate that, right? So, um, you know, another thing I've always wanted to do was like use my phone as a data collection device and like go on my skates or, or my bike or something and just like go around my neighborhood and then collect the data from the GPS and then 
visualize that somehow, you know? So, I mean, I, I think this idea of just playfulness and, and being open-minded is, is really the best way I can answer that. Um, and how I fell into it, I just, again, it was, it was out of necessity. It was, it was out of fear, right? I, I always feared I wasn't good enough in one discipline. So I had to be experimental. I had to be playful. I had to take risks. Um, I had to be willing to fail. Otherwise I wasn't gonna be good enough in just my one main discipline. Thank you. And I still feel that way. I still feel that way. I, I think that's, it's wonderful. And, you know, you mentioned it in your talk a few times about just, it's, it's almost like you're at play. And I see that a, a lot in your work. Um, yeah. th this question is from Arlene Rosa. Um, if you get constructive criticism, what elements do they mainly call you out on? Uh, uh, I, I feel like, I feel like, they want to, they want to, they have some constructive criticism for me, <laughs> which is fine. Um, uh, so I think what I get called out most is the fact that I will sometimes label myself as a designer and they say, yeah, but you're never doing work for others, right? You're not designing for clients. Um, you're just kind of working as an artist. You work kind of more for yourself. Um, so I, I get called out on that a lot. Um, now I, I do, I have done, and I occasionally will do more designerly work that I'm working with a client. Um, but I'm in a fortunate position where, you know, I'm, I'm paid to teach by a university. So I don't rely on my income to sell sprockets for some billionaire. I don't have to do that. So when I do take on a project, I take on projects that I want to take on that I think are fun or meaningful. Um, one piece that I'll just share with you, I won't show you anything, but I designed a book. I was 30 years old at the time. I designed a, like, you know, when you're a kid, you play with like these activity books, like you do these mazes and word scrambles and puzzles and silly poems. So I designed a activity, activity book for menopausal and perimenopausal women. And, um, you know, as a 30 year old male, I had no business designing that book, but these people approached me, they saw my work in a gallery and they go, we, are you interested in doing this? And I had to illustrate it and, and lay out the work and come up with everything. And it was, it was such a wonderful experience. It was so quirky and unusual. Um, and I just like to kind of share that story because you just, you never know what you're going to be asked to do as an artist or as a designer. Um, but I, I'm probably called out on that the most. Uh, just like the fact that like I could do design, but I don't necessarily do design for clients. Um, here's a good question uh, from Jeretsi Ariano. What is the best piece of advice you've been given? That I've been given? Oh boy, I've, I've been given... I mean, I've been given lots of advice. Um, I'm pretty stubborn and thick headed that usually when I get advice, it goes in one ear and out the other. Um, I tend to give myself advice just through observation and watching other people make mistakes. And I go, Oh, I should, I should avoid that. <laughs> um, but like I said, growing up, I was, um, like, I wasn't necessarily an artist. A lot of my advice that translates over, it comes from the sports world. I was a, I was a, I was a pretty good athlete. Um, so I had a lot of coaches that would give me sort of advice, you know, um, and, and like one of, one of them was that, you know, you have to, you have to play as much with your head as you do with your body. Right. Like, so when you're like a 15 or 16 year old kid and you're playing soccer or something, you know, you think I just have to run faster and play harder but sometimes you have to take a step back and be self-reflective and you have to play smarter and that's a better approach. And then when you combine that with being able to play harder, then you really can go to, to new places. And I think being an artist is, is sort of the same, the same thing. You know, you, you do need to put in the time, you do need to put in the work uh, and then the effort, but sometimes you have to take a step back and go, what am I doing? What am I really trying to accomplish? And is this the best way to do that? Is there a smarter way of doing this? Um, and like, what's my concept behind the work? You know, uh, very often when I teach, you know, 
I give up an assignment to the students and just like, boom, they just go right into making it based on some of the student samples that I showed them or based on the demo. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, slow down. I'm like, what's your idea? Like, what are you trying to say with this? Um, so, you know, I think some advice that I've gotten, not necessarily from the art world, but it applies is, is that idea of stop, you take inventory, think about it and then go back. And, and I, I, again, I got that from the sports world, but it, it's applicable in the art world as well. That goes, uh, that goes well with uh, another question, which you, you just touched on was a, kind of like a follow-up to that one was what advice would you give to any other students, uh, to an upcoming artist? Uh, uh, I, well, in addition to that, but I, I, I'll piggyback, I guess, a little bit. And one thing would be um, your ideas don't be afraid of your own ideas. Um, there's a lot of great ideas that I've had in my life that I never pursued that I then saw in a gallery or on TV or in a book and I and, and it with, with great acclaim. And I'm like, I had that idea 10 years ago or five years ago. Why didn't I do it? Why didn't I try to do something with that idea? It was a good idea. Everyone loves that idea, but I thought, oh, they're gonna hate it. They're gonna think it's stupid or whatever. So have some confidence in yourself in that you do have good ideas. Don't be afraid of your ideas. And, and if it's a little unusual or quirky, all the more reason why you should pursue it. Um, I'm not saying be bizarre, but you know you don't have to follow the flow all the time, and don't be afraid to go against the grain. That's okay. Very well said. Um, here's here's one. I know you touched on this one when in your talk, uh, but I figured give you the the opportunity to. You know, to respond to it, uh, because I, I know you, you had mentioned that you get asked this frequently with uh, what, what does your artwork represent? Does your art represent something about you? Yeah, I, I think it really represents more of just how my brain works. Um, you know, there's an overarching sort of themes connecting all of these. And it's, it seems to be this sort of dynamic balance between like this, this I'm getting into semiotics here, but it was like this binary set of ideas. It's always like this pinned against this. And what are the similarities and what are the differences and how do they kind of rub up against each other to, to create energy? So, you know, like with the transparent microfilm, for example, it's this idea of like transparency, being able to see through something and then lack of transparency, like where you can't see through something, right? And like, how does that play with, with light? You know, like when light is projected, the light is blocked, the light is revealed. Um, and and, and that, that kind of, that similar way of thinking plays throughout. It's like with the trains, the subway images, there's very much what's present in that work is this idea of a static image, meaning one single image capturing one moment in time. But simultaneously, it's, it's many images stitched together that capture many moments in time. So when you look at a photograph, traditionally, you think of it as that is an instantaneous moment. It's one moment in time. But when you look at my trains, it's not one moment in time. It's many moments in time. Some of those images took minutes, several minutes to stitch together the one single image that you're consuming in one moment in time. So it's like this, this cyclical idea of like static image, but temporal image and you know, one moment in time versus many moments in time. And it's all existing there. Um, legibility, illegibility. And like, where's the line, right? A lot of my typefaces are, you certainly wouldn't want to read a whole book in them, but if you put in a little effort, you it's like, oh, wait a minute, I, I do see the image. And, and so I, I, I think that's, that's how I would answer that question. So it's always like this, these things that are playing against each other um, yeah, that's, that's, I find that to be rooted in everything I do. Do you, do you, uh, do you have a, a favorite artwork by any chance or artwork that you connect with the most? Yeah, but probably not a visual. Um, 
there's there's a poem by E.E. E. Cummings, um, and I don't even know what the title of the poem is, I because I, that some of them aren't, aren't titled, um, but it's um, a leaf falls loneliness. That's it. That's the whole poem. But when you look at it visually, right? He did this on a typewriter. He typed it in such a way that the structure, the visual structure of the poem reinforces the meaning of the poem, reinforces the idea of loneliness and isolation and singularity. So if you look up, if you, if you come across that poem, you'll see what I'm talking about. Things like that, I think really kind of really inspire me. Um, and of course I like all kinds of stuff from the design world and stuff from the animation world and stuff from the art world, but um, it's, it's really some of the ideas that come out in from the literary world first. They're, they're actually ahead of, you know, ahead of the game. Um, you know, they were ahead of, um, of interactivity and, and um, hypertext, like jumping and linking to somewhere else. They were ahead of that way before the internet became like semi-mainstream in the 80s and 90s. Um, Samuel Beckett was writing literature that was doing that very thing. Um, uh, Nabokov was writing literature that was doing that very thing. So um, I'm, I'm actually kind of inspired by a lot of literary forms. What was the name of the poet again? It... The first one was uh, E. E. Cummings. So E. Period. E. Period. Cummings. Um, and the, that particular poem was "A Leaf Falls Loneliness," and it's. Um, it's very mathematical in nature. I wish I could kind of explicate it for you, but um, there's something really nice about that poem. You described it really nicely. That's why I was like, I'm, I'm going to write it down and look it yeah, up. Yeah, you should. Yeah, maybe after we can we can stay online or something, and I'll I'll, I'll show it to you because I, I have a file of it on my computer. But <laughs> um, here's a a a comment and not a question, but I love how you incorporate these type of, of artwork. Super interesting. Um, Thank you. Uh, here, I think here's something. Um, you know, you you did talk uh, about like uh, spontaneity in your work, and you know, just just getting getting into the creative, I guess, mode. But here's one from Luis Alonso Robles. Uh, he says, "Hi, what is your creative process when starting a project?" Oh. Um, yeah, that's kind of a question I fear because I don't know if I have a, a creative process. Um, I just, usually something just hits me like an idea, not necessarily a vision, not a finished product, but just like an idea that I want to explore. Um, and then I just start, I'll just start playing and tinkering and then that leads me to something else. And then that leads me to something else. And then I get a finished piece. Um, it's obviously a little bit different when I'm designing, right? I, I um, you know, a lot of these animated fonts that I make are inspired by just something I just happen to see when I go for a walk. I'm like, oh, that's moving interesting. And then I go, can I make that? Can I make that into type somehow? Or can I take that idea and animate it somehow? Uh, and that, that very often triggers something um, in, in the work. And, um, you know, sometimes ideas just pop into my head. Most of the time it's just accidental. And so what I would, what I would add on to that is if you're someone who has a hard time just sort of like sitting down and saying, okay, <clears throat> time to be creative. <laughs> I can't do that. Um, my, my advice would be just experience the world, experience as much as you can, right? Go travel, speak to different people, try different foods, you know, go to different cultures, uh, go to different countries, go to music venues, just try to pick up a new skill. Like if you, if you don't know how to do something, like try to do it, archery, I don't know, you know, like just try it because you just never know. It's usually these new experiences, which of course are very difficult during a pandemic, but these new experiences usually trigger something in you and you go, ah, oh, wait a minute. And then it makes you see the world in a new way that leads to creativity. So if, if, you, if you can't generate creativity, then um, just generate new experiences and just let, let your brain do the rest of the work. That is one of the things that the 
pandemic, I think, has done for a lot of us is forced us into like this, this creative mindset to try to work beyond. Yeah. It's it's very well said. Um, uh, here here's a here's one from Patricia Policarpio. She says your music reminds me of Lennon's Revolution Nine, inspired <laughs> by by the Beatles. Any chance? Um, I mean, I think every everybody who does anything with music is is either uh, inspired by the Beatles or even whether they realize it or not. Um, yeah, I like the Beatles. Um, I wouldn't say I was actively thinking of that. Um, so the the music or the composition, uh, I would actually say I'm probably more inspired by someone like John Cage. And you may or may not know who that is, but he was a really kind of experimental composer in the um, 50s, 60s. Um, and so what, what you were hearing wasn't necessarily developed as a musical score. It was the sounds that were agitating or manipulating each letter form. So if there was a D that was legible, each time I hit the key, it made it a little bit more illegible each time I hit the key of the piano. Um, and so when, when I put it into a video program and I had, you know, I had a, something that said a, I, A, M, C, O, N, and I string it all together. When I play it back, you're just hearing all these different random notes and sounds and, and it sort of yielded uh, sort of almost like an accidental musical score. Um, I have done other I have incorporated audio in other pieces that not, obviously not presented here where um, I was a little bit more aware of, of the music. Um, so yeah, I, I don't wanna say I was directly involved, uh, uh, inspired by the Beatles, um, but I, I, I do appreciate their work. And, and my poem piece with the letters that were just swirling around, that was actually the first piece that I got into an exhibition and um, it was like a video art exhibition. And one of the other artists in that exhibition was Yoko Ono, of all people. So I was like, hey, I'm in good company. It, it, it gave me some confidence. Um, I think, uh, you know, just, just on, the, on the basis of time, I think uh, what I'll do is I'll, there were a few other questions that we didn't get a chance to field. So what I'll do, I'm, I'm going to copy them and I'm going to paste them into a Word document and then I'll send it over to you. Sure. And if... Uh, you know, if you get a get some time, uh, maybe res respond to some of those. That, that yeah, I'd be happy to. I appreciate it. Um, uh, and I, you I, know, if anybody in the in the audience, if you want, to just you know, contact me directly too. You know, my I think there's an email on my website, so you can always just say, uh, "Hey, I, want, I have a question," and that's fine too. What is uh, what is your website, Tori? Uh, it's it's on the screen here. It's it's just my name, toritarasi.com. Okay. So I own my name. I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did did want to mention. Uh, we uh, thank you, thank you, Tori, for for taking time to, to visit with us today. Uh, I you know I, I do truly mean your what I enjoy most about your artwork is that creative aspect and. Is the idea that that any at any instant uh, throughout your day something might uh, interact with you, um, whether you know whether it be physically or emotionally, um, and somehow you you devise these ideas and and you've created some phenomenal solutions, um, like for instance the uh, the taking taking written form, bringing it into like through these processes like Illustrator and then jumping over into laser cutting on these transparent panels. You know, the, the creativity that goes into your work, it's just just phenomenal. Uh, you're getting some more, some more thank you uh, from Chris Leonard, Phyllis Leverage. She says, thank you for coming, Tori. I have been looking forward to, you, to uh, seeing your work. Great presentation. It's been a, a year in the process there, Phyllis. I'm glad we finally made it made it happen. Um, uh, I did want to mention also uh, we have uh, the the Library Art Gallery uh, here with STC. They've always been very supportive of, of all our endeavors for the art department. They do have another event uh, coming up at three o'clock, uh, another art event. So if you want to jump onto their website, you can see the link for their video. Um, we do have spring semester, 
spring semester, we have we have a, a visiting artist by the name of uh, Mayuko Ono Gray, who she's going to have give a, a live artist talk, uh, and. And we're actually going to go out there and, and record her, and uh, she's going to give a live artist talk in February. I know her; she's very, she's very good, <laughs> super talented. And you know, she she has that creative element, and then the technical aspect. I, yeah. I just I enjoy the variety in the world of art, and just a hyper realistic imagery, really, really, really illustrated, really detailed. You know, even even more interesting, like like I, so like what you said also about artists and you asked them like why do you do what you what you make and i think it also connects to uh, one of your artworks that that talked about like we're just all interconnected because i see a lot of the ideas like a lot of the reasons why artists create are somehow interconnected they just hmm. develop into in, in different visual form uh so thank you this this will bring us to to the end of uh, our artist talk sorry thank you one more time for taking the time. All right. Thank you.